along with the other technologies that Africans brought to America, the dam building, the irrigation system, agriculture, how to lay out cities, the uh, governmental structure, the silversmith, the goldsmith, the uh, navigational science, uh, chemistry, along with all of those technologies, we also brought over the technology or the art of healing and how to use herbs in harmony with nature and in harmony with whatever the disease. So we have this large herbal history, a botany history, that comes along with us. And I'm going to overview some of that as it pertains to the herbs used by those Africans who were enslaved on the islands called the Sea Islands in the Atlantic Ocean. They go from St. Augustine, Florida, all the way up to uh, North Carolina, Cape Fear. And of course, the Gullah culture extends inland about 50 miles and goes all the way up to Tidewater, Virginia, and parts of the Chesapeake Bay. So I'm going to go over those kind of uh, herbs that were indigenous to the area and how we use our African science of, of medicine and botany and chemistry to perfect the uh, cure in the healing arts. So let us look at these herbs and look at the area from which we came from, where this knowledge originated, which we call the East Coast of Africa. Yeah, many of us were shipped out of the east coast of Africa along the area of Nambia where our first cowboys and documented American history came from along with the ones from Gambia, Angola, Gabon, Nigeria. Basically, we identified the Sea Island people as being shipped out of Sierra Leone, which is a you know, little island out there called Vans Island, I want to say how you choose to pronounce it, which is a shipping port out there here in the Atlantic Ocean we come from this area, we brought along with us the technologies that I mentioned, and along with that we brought the pharmaceutical science, herbal pharmaceutical science, or what we call herbal medicine, or the use of herbs to perfect a cure, to help the body come back to an ease state and get out of a disease state. Now, as you can see, the um, various ways that we adapted to communicating with the Europeans caused us to get this, these various accents and it also affected the Europeans. So they talk with a African accent which they call the uh, British and the Spanish accent. That's what the Moors influence on Spain of course because they didn't have that much of a vocabulary, very limited because they didn't have the technology to produce that vocabulary. So we introduced a lot of words to the British, the Spanish, the Danes, the French, the Dutch. And we brought that information that we had from our civilization over with us, especially along in this area where we're going to focus in North America. Because as you know, the majority of Africans in the Americas and South America, we're going to focus in the area right along here, which was controlled lastly by the British, but the Spanish and the French and the Russians were all involved in the Sea Island area. We taught them herbal information that helped save them from many diseases and later they turned us against this information and then sold it back to us. Now, as I said before, Sea Islands are the islands in the Atlantic Ocean extend from St. Augustine to Savannah, Charleston, this area here, and the Carolinas, Georgetown, we're coming all the way up to this area, up to North Carolina, and it extends all the way up to the Tidewater area, this area here, Tidewater, Virginia area, and parts of Maryland and Delaware. That's all Gullah culture and extends inland, all the way down the coast, 50 miles inland. But we're talking about the Sea Islands down here, which we call the Gullah Islands. And we're going to focus on the herbal heritage of that area and how it's uh, influenced uh, us and how we uh, combine cures. In specific, we, they also sold a lot of uh, slaves who were ancestors who were slaves. This is Bans Island again, which is outside the coast of Sierra Leone. They sold us for that technology we had, the rice smiths, people were silversmiths, excuse me, the blacksmith, the jewelry makers, those involved in farming, the basket makers, 
and also the doctors and pharmacists. In fact, in South Carolina, they had to outlaw the usage of the uh, African doctors because all the white doctors were buying them and used them in their practices. This is an image of an, of a central god, the rice god of Sir Pro Island, Sierra Leone. We uh, knew that Harris was spiritual and part of God's creation, and we had a great reverence and respect for them. And so we built um, these uh, statues to help us focus our holistic energy upon them. And that was a rice god. We didn't worship the statue as god. We just used it as a symbol to keep us focused on what we were about. And a lot of times when using herbal remedies, we uh, incorporate dance. As you can see, this is a cloth. And you see the candles there and the herbs on the ground. Herbs were part of our ceremonies. They're part of all our rituals. And we have a great reverence and respect for them. And this is a so-called 19th century hoodoo dance. Again, we use herbs in our ceremonies. And here we see a, a reenactment of a voodoo dance. Here we have the drum and the herbs. Again, they use leaves and the teas. So we always incorporated our herbal knowledge as a part of religious ceremonies, as a part of medical art, and a part of games, and a part of our dress. Now I'm going to go over briefly some of the uh, plant cures used in the Sea Islands. The aphrodisiacs, or so-called sexual stimulants, we use the nettle, horse nettle, alone or with black root or black pepper or blood root. Now, nettle helps stimulate hair growth and of course the vagina and uterus work with hair along with the eyes and the ears and your digestive tract. So anytime you stimulate the hair to grow, you stimulate your ability to receive stimulation. They use cotton root in specific seed for abortions actually, but it's outlawed because it's so contaminated. And for arthritis, we use cherry bark, or six cherries as well, or cherry juice, or almonds are good for arthritis, along with uh, for pain remedies, we use white willow, boswellian, and of course sassafras, which used a lot in the islands. For backache, we use the sassafras, sassafras and red oak bark. You can today use uh, white oak bark, uh, white willow for the pain, excuse me. A bath that's invigorated, we use the Irish moss, some people call it Spanish mark moss along with red oak. We also use the moss for high blood pressure. Put it in your shoes. That helps lower the pressure. Also, we use onions for pressure. Today, they use garlic and, the, of course, the moss. And for breath, when you have shortness of breath, they use the onions. It helps remove the mucus out of your lungs so you won't get a shortness of breath. And for burns, they use cow dung. Cow dung is, is uh, a mixture of herbs, ground up by the cow so you can put it on burns and we use the minerals from that. The coals generally use the muckles, the brown muckle and the button snake root of bone set or the one another muckle called a marsh muckle and we use it with pine tar. They use a lot of pine treatments now for coals called pignoxinol or coenzyme Q10 or a tea tree oil. So we use the mullen and the oils, pine oil for herbs. In the coals, again, we use the pine tar. Uh, in the old days, uh, we, the grand ancestors would put sugar on pine tar and you would eat it. You know, they spread the pine over your chest to open up your lungs. For bed sores and colds, and you're in bed, we use white root. For colds of the body, we use black root and white root. As you can see, onions repeat themselves along with the black root and white root. For indigestion, we use olive. Today, we use olive vera juice for upset digestive tract or colic that sort of thing. For problems with conception, we use white root and speed will for colds and cramps. We use a life everlasting which is used for a tonic drink. Because again, we're going back to the minerals such as silica and we find that a lot of minerals in the spider webs. So they use spider webs and turpentine. We don't use turpentine these days. We use spider webs and tea tree oil in the place of turpentine. Decongestion, decongestion congestion of the lungs, we use life everlasting, snake root, and again, the uh, pine oil, or tea tree oil, or co co uh, pignogenol, or coenzyme Q10, excuse me. Of course, lemon juice is always good for congestion because it helps speed the blood and cleanse the body. So we use raw lemon juice, raw grapefruit juice, raw lime juice, raw orange juice. Again, we use the bone set as a diaphoretic to help open up the pores, to sweat up the 
sweat the release the, the bacteria and waste out of your system. A good diuretic is the Jerusalem artichoke, which is also used for sugar diabetes and kidney weed. Drop C, we use the Jerusalem artichoke again. And for fever, we use the bitter apple, bone set, light everlasting, mullein, nightshade, and one of the muckles. Again, we put in the the uh, life everlasting, perhaps with some uh, Irish moss or Spanish moss in your shoes for foot pain. And for indigestion, you use the blackberry or red raspberry leaves, or blue raspberry leaves, sometimes called bilberry. And rinsing the hair with mistletoe, which is a parasite kind of plant, or sage or nettle is very good. Headaches, use Indian shoot. Uh, we don't use the soda and hot water that much these days. We use fever fume for that. Hemorrhaging or bleeding, we use the minerals in cobwebs or soot or clay. Itching, we use one of the laurels, hairy laurel. Again, for jaundice and retention of fluid, we use the Jerusalem artichoke, which is actually uh, not an artichoke at all. It's in the potato family. Uh, kidneys, we use the kidney weed. Menstruation, we use the life everlasting, probably with some red raspberry leaves or probably some uh, white oak bark that we use today. For pain in general, we use comfrey and pokeru on the olives. Again, we use white willow for that. Poultices, we use the clay along with the moss. In pregnancy, we use, of course, today we use a lot of red raspberry leaves, but you can use blessed thistle as well. In rheumatism, we use angelica. And loss of sight, we use sutras. Snake bite, we use the aloe vera. Angelica tree, we use sores, we use senna, which is also a laxative. We use elderberry, we use gum tree, we use okra blossoms. We use old hag's table, which is mushroom. We use St. John's uh, wort, as they call it today. And we use a lot of St. John's to conquer, which is called blood root. For sprains, we use a clay poultice, comfrey, along with perhaps some menthol for a poultice for sprains and the clay. As a stimulant, we use cotton. These days, we use ephedra for a stimulant, or yohembe, or damiana, and uh, ginseng. The stings, we use fennel. They used to use tobacco, but it's so contaminated, we don't use that much anymore. And for stomach pain, we use the, the mints, or pear, peppermint, spearmint, the mints, and the tar. And for strength, we use ton as a tonic, we use sassafras. Swollen limbs, we use mullein. Especially if you get a pig bite, we use the mullein and, and cayenne pepper and wrap it, put that on the wound and wrap it. For ticks, we use one of the muckles. And for tonics, of course, sassafras is the most popular one, along with life everlasting. For severe cold, we use bone set, it helps pull out the mu mucus. And whooping cough, we use one of the muckles and pine tar. And asha berry is called uh, too tall, which we call uh, mullein today. We use that for worms. Of course, you can use garlic and Jimson weeds and Samson root. Those are some of the popular remedies that we use in the Sea Islands today. We're still effective in remedies today to help get your body back to a state of ease and out of dis-ease. Now, we're gonna focus on the biochemical makeup of the Europeans. We call them Euro European Americans and the biochemical makeup of the African Americans. As you can see, we have fennel, a dog fennel. This is a picture of it. This is a smooth plant with a slender, many branch stem, as you can see. And, it's, and uh, the stem branches reach about six inches to two feet tall with numerous narrow leaves, right there. And yellow flowers. It grows in the meadows, old fields, and along the roads. Now, we see that in the biochemical makeup of Africans, we use it for one purpose, and the Europeans use it for another. We use it to prevent conception, reduce abortions, used for inflammations of the muscle swellings. It's used for digestion. That's why they have it for hiccups. Why the European Americans use the fennel as a cognitive and a stimulant. It's mostly used for digestive disorders. They boil it in barley water to increase milk production in nursing women. This is fennel used for increasing the milk. But they don't uh, uh, allude all of these remedies to the Africans. Although the Africans taught it to the Europeans, the Europeans want to take all the medicinal value and claim that they are the ones who discovered it as they have discovered America and other things that they have stolen. 
fennel is quite popular for those kind of ailments, swellings, digestive problems, and to increase the milk production. I pointed to Jimson weed. Of course, I have the Latin name here, which I'm not alluding to. But as you can see, the Africans, the Native Americans, and the Europeans used the herb for different purposes. Understanding that this herbal knowledge and recorded history disseminated from Africans to the Native Americans to the Europeans. The Europeans basically just stole it, claimed it for that themselves, saying that they discovered the herb. Now, the Jimson weed is used for colds and respiratory diseases, hail as a smoke, dry leaves, or it's applied to wounds. We use it mostly for colds and respiratory problems. As you can see, the Europeans use it for pain and rheumatism, and they apply it on externally for bruises, wounds, and inflammation, while the American Indian uses it as a narcotic for pain, and then mustard plasters, put it on the chest of asthmatic people, along with mustard seed and clay, making a mustard plaster with it. That's called Jimson weed. Next herb we're gonna look at is the muckles I was referring to earlier. I will use a lot of muckles. We have the sea muckle. It grows about two and a half feet high, it grows in the marshes, which we have a lot of around the sea islands. And it's used primarily for colds and skin diseases and to help take ticks off your body. Sometimes we mix it with the pine tar and we put that on to, for strains in your muscles. So we call those the muckles. Another herb that we use is called mullen, sometimes called tutal or ashaberry. As you can see, I have African usage of it, the European uses of it, and the Native American use of it. It is used for colds. Sometimes we combine mullen with poke root and alum and jimson weed for backache. And for kidney problems, we use mullen. As you can see, the Native Americans use it for the same sort of condition, colds, asthma, and is applied on swellings, bruises, and then the Europeans use it for colds, diarrhea, howls, also tumors, sores, gout, sore throat. They're using it for the same purposes they were taught to use it for by the Africans, but they're using their medical terms more so in trying to allude to these sort of slave or unevolved terms for the Africans. And they are embedding their racism even in the jargon that they use to describe the herbs here. Now we have the famous nightshade. Um, I have the African use of it, the Native American use of it, and the European use of it. It helps healings. It's a bushy herb, fibrous roots branching out. It's, this is not to be confused with the deadly nightshade. This is just the nightshade as we call it. It's used for colds and sores and accumulation for fluid in your body, which we call dropsy, inflammation of the mucous membrane. Once the mucus collects, it irritates the membrane and causes inflammation. So we use the uh, nightshade to pull out the, the mucus to relieve you of the symptoms of having a cold. Now we have red oak. Spanish oak. It's a southern tree. It grows a lot in sandy soil or on hills. It grows about 60 to 80 feet high. And as you can see again, I have the African use and the European use because we have different biochemical makeups. Now I'm going to read what the Europeans wrote about our usage of the herb. It's written in a book probably of uh, medical plants. And a lot of information is found in Puckett's book on folk beliefs. We have ourselves found the bark of the tree of some service among the Negroes in special cases where a tonic astringent injection was required, using it in one case of prolapsed utera, prolapsed uterus, where the organ became chapped and painful from exposure. The tea made from red oak bark taken from the right side of the tree relieves toothache, menstrual pain, red oak bark tea, chills and fever, red oak bark tea mixed with turpentine and salt. Today we use tea tree oil. 
often used the salt and the turpentine. As you can see, the Europeans use it on topically or externally for cancers and ulcers, internally for diarrhea, sore throat, and hemorrhages. It is an astringent and it stops the secretion of fluid, so it helps bond together the tissue in the cancer ulcer when you apply it externally. And when you take it internally, it helps stop diarrhea because it is astringent. It helps stop bleeding because it's an astringent. We call the bleeding hemorrhaging. Now, in Georgia, malaria, they would use dogwood, cherry bark, and red oak bark for inflammation. They make a strong tea out of it and drink that. They would and mix it with meal uh, and cook to a mush and take it for malaria. Red oak. These are some of the trees and herbs that are used in the Sea Islands all along the coast. Some areas have more than others, but these are the basic remedies. This is sassafras. I have the African usage, the Native American use, and the European use. Sassafras is basically a strong blood cleanser. It's a, it's a tree. It's a small tree. It goes about 10 to 40 feet high. It has a very aromatic, pleasant smell. A lot of people just like to cook it just for the smell. When you're dealing with uh, the bark or the roots, you simmer them for an hour or so in low heat. You only uh, steep leaves and flowers. That means you do not boil them. You just put them in the hot water. So we use the sassafras for measles, it's good for purifying the blood, and we drink it as a tea. The Native Americans use it as a poultice for wounds, wash out your eyes with. It's good to relieve the eruptions, skin eruptions, such as measles, scarlet fever, and relieve coughing and pain in the bladder. The Europeans use the sassafras. Let me read what they say. Sassafras became one of the most important exported articles early in the history of the United States. The bulk of the shipment going to England for treatment of colic, venereal disease and general pain. Sassafras was an important domestic tonic for treating rheumatism, high blood pressure, and as a spring renovator of the blood. As I mentioned, that means a spring tonic. So the Europeans were in desperate need of this herb because of their venereal epidemic, uh, gonorrhea and syphilis was abundant in their countries, along with the uh, rheumatism wasting their muscles and bones and high blood pressure which is epidemic amongst the Europeans and those who eat like the Europeans. Now we have another popular herb on the Sea Islands known as American Senna. Senna is mostly used as a herb that grows about four to six feet high, but it's mostly used as a laxative. However, all laxatives can be used for sores and dressings because they promote the irritation and cleansing of the tissue of waste. So you see the Africans use it for dressing sores, which were abundant when working the cotton and the rice plantations. And the uh, Europeans use it mostly as a cathartic to help the environment. But it's good for uh, cleaning out the bowels, and the cathartic action of it is the laxative action. Next, we're going to look at snake root, Samson's root. Samson's snake root. Now, we have the African use of it, the Na Native American use, and the European use of it. Samson was a black man, by the way, and he found this remedy for snake bites. And, of course, they paid him a lot of money for it, and later they killed him about it, but that's incidental. This is a short stem plant that one to two inches high with straw-colored flowers and leaves about two to four inches long. The Europeans use Samson's snake root for respiratory problems, dyspepsia, Dysentery, that's basically other terms for diarrhea and pneumonia. They had a lot of problems trying to adapt to eating this new food the Europeans did, and they got in a lot of cases of diarrhea from frying and so much oil and grease and rotten food that they used to eat. They had the African use of it, which is mostly used for indigestion, Samson's snake root tea, and it's used a lot in ceremonies and rituals. The Native Americans use it to stop pains in the stomach or to cure back backache is brewed into a hot or cold infusion, or they chew the roots. And that's what you call a chew stick. They would chew in the root to get rid of the plaque on their teeth. We call it Samson's snake root. Used a lot in ceremonies to purify your body. The snake being symbolic of the symbol of the female symbol and the male symbol, the double huru as we call it. So it has a symbolical use. This is white snake root. 
as you can see, I have the African use again and the European use. To let you know, we have different uses for the same plant. The plant has a smooth, many branched stem, as you can see, with pairs of large egg-shaped leaves. They're about three inches long. It grows in wood thickets and clearings. Now, I'll read what they say. They say, much use is made of this plant snake root in general among the Negroes in this state, particularly in the low stages of pneumonia, to which they're particularly liable. That's basically saying that we catch colds a lot. They didn't say we're standing in the water all day picking the rice and had not, not an adequate clothing, no windows for our slave houses, so we got cold drafts all the time and we're always damp and had to sleep on the floor. They don't mention all that. Just say we're liable for these diseases. We are, not them. The Europeans use it as a tonic, diuretic, and for fevers, and pipicis in children. And nonetheless, it's most popular use for cleansing the system of colds and flu, and is used as a tonic generally. Always popular for using with colds, however. Then we have the elderberry. Again, I have the African use of this plant, the Native American and the Europeans. It's used as for bowl, boils and apply a poultice of mashed elderberry leaves. We use it for that topical reasons, basically. Most of we use the flowers, the berries, and the bark, and the root. And I have the official use. The elderberries were official in the United States Pharmacopoeia back in 1820 and 1831. The flowers were official in the United States Pharmacopoeia in 1831 and 1905. And of course, it's been taken out since then, and they substituted with drug usage. But it's used by the Native Americans for, as a painkiller and a relief from agu and inflammations, headache, as you can see, it's used for colds and the discomforts associated with colds. That's the headaches, the inflammations, the, the, uh, the colic, diarrhea, and the fever. That's elderberry. Let's go to another herb, or herb as some people like to say, not using the H. That's the Spanish influence, or the influence of the more upon the Spanish, actually. This is life everlasting. We use the entire plant. It's used in tonics. The African use for it is to relieve headaches. And it's used for a tonic generally by the Africans on the Sea Islands. The Native Americans use the leaves mixed with lard to apply to swollen glands or mumps, inflammation of the glands. The Europeans use it for bruises, tumors, fever, inflammation, influenza, ulcerations of the mouth and throat, pulmonary disease, bronchial complaints, and bowel disorders. As you can see again, the same physiological condition is repeating itself with the Europeans' digestive problems, colds, flus, diarrhea, and general inability to deal with these new type of plants. It takes a while to adjust to them since they didn't have the bacteria flora adequate to metabolize them. Plus they were combining them with a lot of um, animal byproducts and irritants to the system. The cotton, uh, of course, was, they chewed a root to stimulate the sexual organs, and of course it was used for abortions, and it's basically been outlawed as a herbal remedy altogether. The Native Americans use it to ease labor in small doses, but you give it too strong, it causes, causes strong contractions and it, and it causes abortions. Mild use of it, a little of it is good, but too much it stimulates the contraction, similar to ergot, which is used to stimulate contractions. The Europeans use it for inflammation of the uterus, sterility, inflammation of the vagina, menstrual irregularities, and reproductive problems. The pelvic girdle and the reproductive system deteriorates on an acid diet, and their diet being primarily acid is causing reproductive problems, plus the lack of exercise and causing them to have birthing cramps, which we associate with uh, giving birth all this cramps and pains and hollering, which is a sign of degeneration of the reproductive system. Now we have bone set. We mostly use that for colds. We use the tops and the leaves. Here you have the Europeans use it as an emetic tonic, a laxative for rheumatism, catarrh, drops in typhoid fever, it's using it for colds and as a laxative and to help induce vomiting. We have the wild cherry, wild black cherry, as I mentioned before, is used for arthritis and rheumatism, gouty arthritis, gout as they call it, gouty arthritis as well. 
we use the bark for that. Remember, you simmer box at a low temperature, you simmer seeds and roots at a low temperature, you steep flowers and leaves. The Native Americans use the wild cherry. You'll see it in a lot of cold remedies it's for pains of childbirth and sore chest. The Europeans use it basically for the same thing. We get very specific in our picking of the herbs, and we use the cherry box for menstrual flow to help strengthen the uterus, combine it with other herbs like whorehound to help strengthen the mucosal membrane of the prostate and the uterus. And again, it's used a lot for arthritis and rheumatism today. Black cherry. They even sell it in a juice form in a health food store, which is adequate if you can't get the root itself. Just use the uh, juice. Now we're getting into tomatil, or blood root as it's sometimes called, or St. John the Conqueror is used in a lot of uh, spiritual rituals to rid the body of evil spirits and illnesses. Now we have the black root, which the whole, the root is used itself. This is how the plant looks. I'll read what they say. Much use is made of this plant in St. John's, at St. John's Island, as an alterative. It is supposed to be possessed of decided value. It is well known as the black root of the Negroes. They didn't know how to use it, so basically they just said it was some Negro type of plant. That's in the medicinal plants book. Now we get to blood root, which is a shrub, and I have the European usage, the African use, and you can see the Europeans those close relatives of New Jersey tea. It's a close relative of New Jersey tea. It's used as astringent, expectorant, sedative, and antispasmodic. Basically, they use it for colds, and they use it for those conditions associated with colds, such as sore throat and sore mouth. Blood root is still used for colds, basically. Some people call it dragon's blood, and it's used in ceremonies. The dragon represented the 12 signs of the zodiac, so when you're trying to cleanse yourself of the 12, so you can go up the 12 steps of Jacob's Ladder, you use dragon root in those uh, religious uh, holistic ceremonies of our so-called root doctors. Very popular plant, blood root and St. John the Conqueror, which we call a uh, tomatile. It's used as a chew stick as well. This is blackberry. We use the root. It's used for griping in the stomach or general stomach pains, which you associate it with diarrhea, which we call dysentery. You brew the tea and you take it for diarrhea. The Native Americans use it for the same thing, as well as the Europeans. They mostly have the diarrhea. Remember, dysentery destroyed most of the European army in the South Pacific. Diarrhea was a major killer of the European armies, diarrhea and constipation. Today, we don't think of it as a disease of such that you can see the word sentry, which comes from soldier, a dysfunctional soldier, dysentery. It destroyed the armies. That's why they call it dysentery. The Native Americans use it for diarrhea and a severe form called dysentery. Sometimes we make a poultice of it and use that to relieve pneumonia, putting it on the chest and stomach areas to relieve your pain. Now, let's take a look at another herb that's used in the Sea Islands. That would be ashaberry, or black cohosh, or black snake root. Ashaberry is used for women's kind of complaints, as we say today, women's. It is used for colds, basically, and fever. It's very good. It's usually combined with uh, blue cohosh. Some people chew or boil the leaf to relieve themselves of worms. So ashaberry or black cohosh is used for worms, colds, and flus, and is also used as a tonic for the female reproductive organ. Then we have bitter apple. This is the plant ashaberry down here. I don't have a picture of bitter apple. Bitter apple is a fruit with a, with a rind removed. When you remove the rind, we use that for colds and fevers. It's commonly dried in the stove or by the sun, and it's used for cathartis to help cleanse your body of waste. Of course, we use that in conjunction with a uh, henbane. Another herb we use in the Sea Islands is poke root. We also make a salad out of it, poke root salad and dandelion leaf salad. Uh, it was one of the famous salads that George Washington Carver liked to eat, by the way. Poke root is the African use, Native American use, and the European use. 
We use poke root to lose weight. Place some poke root in whiskey or drink. We don't use the whiskey and drink. We sometimes use what we call vegetable glycerin. Scrofula, swollen glands. We use a china berry tree and some poke root with that. For swollen glands. Or it's used as a salve. We mix that with uh, an ointment such as pine tar, rub it on sores. So you can see from the official use of the pharmaco United States Pharmacopeia, it's used for colds and it's used for stomach complaints, for leaves. Poke root berries are quite popular as well. But these remedies have long since been lost to us and we are going to the hospital expecting a cure when we have them right at hand. These plants grow quite prolific, really. You can't stop them from growing once you plant them. This is black root. I'm read the other African-American use. Much use is made of this plant. I went over it before with you. As an alterator, supposed to be possessed of a decided value. As I went over this one plant with you earlier. Just trying to reinforce the fact that we have a uh, holistic understanding of the plants, and sometimes that's deceived and is misinterpreted by the Europeans. As you can see from the Papyrus of Ibers, the German fellow who stole this medical book. We had the caraway, the amces, the zamces, and sea salt to make suppositories. We always knew how to combine the plants properly. We combined it with fig grapes, caraway seed, we combine this together in a tonic along with peppermint. And we use these herbs and we brought this knowledge with us. This is the ancient text with it in there to show you that we didn't happenstance fall upon this knowledge. It was always a part of our culture and civilization. We simply transported it over here when they stole us. They stole our science, they stole our culture, and they stole our spiritual system which they call religion. Now you can see the holistic remedy again. We're going to use the incest. We're going to incense. We're going to burn that. Caraway seeds. We used to soak fish in that. We're combining that with wax. We use red. It's not red lead. It's the red lady. But they don't understand this the screaming of the gods. Of course, to them that meant bowel movements. To us, it meant honey. And we use figs, and we use fresh lead earth. And they're thinking it needs the the uh, metal, but it doesn't allude to the metal, it alludes to a type of clay. But when you allow your books to be misinterpreted by other people, and then you take their misinterpretation, you get what Carter G. Woodson called a miseducation. And that is our primary problem here. We're miseducated about our herbs and the greatness of our ancestors, and we abuse ourselves and we abuse each other because we don't have the information. Now, I'm going to show you some of the fears of the surrounding herbs, some of these rituals that we do on the sea islands that people associated with evilness. Now, to make someone, there are a variety of ways to cause illness that are not necessarily fatal. Such tricks cost less than killing hurts and are less risky for practitioner and client. In other words, you transfer your anger to, of a person to an object and you take that anger and you bury it in the ground and that releases the anger from you so it won't hurt you. This is one of our ancient rituals here. But uh, again, it's associated with voodoo and you shouldn't do it. What you're doing is getting rid of your anger, getting rid of your fear, putting it in an object and burying it or put it in the river or lake so it can be released out of your system so it won't harm you. Now, to make someone, take some bark and some root from a persimmon tree and some of the root of a fig tree, boil these three ingredients in water, then add some graveyard dust and dissolve it well. Go to the home of the intended victim with the liquid in a small vial, drop one drop just inside his door, and another three drops inside his door. This person will become mysteriously ill. This is a misinterpretation, steeped in ignorance. But actually what is happening here is a person has displeasure and is angry with someone, and they transfer that to the persimmon tree and some of the root of the fig tree and put that in a vial, and that gets rid of the anger gets rid of that spirit, and they take it to the other person who they anger with to help cleanse that spirit out of them. It's a family affair. It was done together in a family where you take your anger, express it to that person, and the people in the village would surround you, and that dispelled the anger. It's part of the uh, new rituals and ceremonies. If you enter anthropology, you'll see how it's done, how we just surround each other 
after their argument between a husband and wife, they let them argue in public. The man wants to beat his wife, they get him a big stick and then give him a bigger stick and surround the couple and help them release the anger in the village because the family is medicine, the village is medicine, and that's part of a fragment of a healing process. Again, it's steeped in voodoo and hoodoo, and we don't fully understand the holistic effect of all of this. All we get is a watered-down version for luck. In other words, you want to use the mountain glory that God has granted you. So you use the dragon's blood, which again is the symbol of the 12 zodiac sign. You see the Chinese use this dragon, which is part of the 12 zodiac signs, which is part of the 12 melanin centers on your brain, which is stimulating your melanin. And you, you wear this in your shoe, in your pocket. Similar, sim similar to the Europeans, to show that they're victorious, they use claw shapes, which you call pointed shoes or they put a claw on their shoes, which you call tassels, which is symbolic of them being predators, being in charge, being great, being warriors, being winners. And so we did the same thing to symbolize this, the 12 melanin centers, the, the 12 principles of, of, uh, of uh, Shepeta. We use all this energy in a symbolic form to call that upon us to help rise us up so we can use it. And this is what the Europeans call luck. Again, a lot of our ancient knowledge is hidden in these cryptic codes and we have to go back and say Kofer and retrieve it. So we are trying to retrieve that knowledge that uh, resides in the Sea Islands and goes all the way up the coasts of St. Augustine, Florida, to South Carolina, North Carolina, Georgia, and the inland Gullah from the Tidewater area, parts of the Chesapeake Bay, inland 50 miles on down the coast, and how we would disperse this information all over America and all over the world, and now we're trying to retrieve it, Sankofa. So we look back into Gullah history, into Gullah herbal knowledge, in order to help give us a clear vision so we can see clearly our destiny and have the tools we need, those natural tools, the herbs we need, to help rid us of dis-ease and put us back in ease with ourselves, with our culture, and with our understanding of each other. And that was just a brief overview of some of the herbs. There are many, many more that we can use, but this helps us to have some herbs that we can use freely and have a good grasp of and a good understanding of in order to rid our body of disease and restore us in a steps by step by step by step degrees of wellness. Gullah Heritage and Gullah Herbology. Thank you.